Morning ladies and gents. I don't know if I mentioned this yet, but I'm in, I've been holed up in a place called Orchatico, doing a bit of voluntary work. And it's a small village in the Pisan Hills in Tuscany, in Italy. And just recently I've been doing a load of editing work on my computer and I'm kind of getting a little bit fed up of that so it's a nice beautiful day and I thought I'd come out and go for a little bit of a walk. The area I'm going to be walking in I just found it on Google Maps. Don't really have any idea where I'm going I just found a, I found a place I'm not even going to try and pronounce it because it's obviously in Italian I don't know what it means I don't know what I'm going to find there and I'm guessing, I don't know, might be a little old house like, like the ones in Spain where they're just sort of like dotted out absolutely in the middle of nowhere. Old abandoned peasant house or a shack or something. So, anyways, it's kind of not really about that. It's more about just going out there, exploring, having a good time and uh, kind of getting my mind together really <laughs> after all the editing I've been doing. So we're in the middle of January and this for me is the month of Birch. Well it is for everyone because it's the first month of the year but obviously you know I'm working with the home deck at the moment. And Birch stands for growth and development. So I kind of want to keep this video relevant. Let's put the camera there. Uh, I want to keep I want to make this video relevant for the month and I want to tell you a story as I'm sort of plodding along. Once upon a time in a land far far away lived a young boy and this young boy he was a very curious young boy a fearless a natural adventurer What we're doing in life echoes of eternity. He grew up in the city of Hull in Yorkshire, England. And in case you're all wondering, the boy was me. The first time I remember sleeping outside was with my cousin and my brothers in a tent we had in the back garden. I know we'd slept out before then, but I was way too young to remember. Being outdoors felt so natural to me from a very young age. If I remember rightly, every time a tent was set up in the back garden and someone's out there sleeping in it, I was always out there right beside them. When you look back at past memories, life seems to be a blur. You might distinctly remember a certain event from a long time ago like it was yesterday, but the hardest part is working out in which order these things took place. I moved in my second home when I was about five years old. That's where I remember actually sleeping outside. Before then, I don't really remember much. One memory that does stand out to me when I was about 13 years old, I was camping in the back garden with the lads and a neighbour. The night was incredibly clear that night, or oh, so I was told. I was there, but I didn't actually witness any of this because I needed glasses, and I'd never worn them in my entire life. From what they described, it was like one of those photos you see that was done with a good 10 grand's worth of camera. I was pretty disappointed. Maybe it was really shit. Maybe there was just kids experiencing something for the first time so it only seemed amazing. I don't think that was the case, but thinking about it like that still to this day helps me sleep at night. If there was any shooting stars that night, I don't even think I'd have coped. The next day, I was on a mission. I needed some glasses as soon as humanly possible. Not because the teachers at school complained about my bad eyesight on a regular basis, but because I needed to see those stars. Within a few weeks, lo and behold, I had some brand spankers. It must have been a summer night because it wasn't long after that, we were all out camping again and I saw them. Now to most, it might not sound so exciting, but to a young Mondo like me, it was like discovering a twinkling treasure trove in the night sky. 
I realised that the stars aren't just distant dots in the night. They're actually magical beacons lighting up the canvas of our dreams, like a window into infinity. I kid you not when I say this, it was a life-changing experience. I think it was a year after that, me and the fellas I knocked around with found an old quarry, about 8 miles or 12 kilometres away. It became abandoned many moons ago, and over the years it filled up with water. I spent the next two summers riding my bike up and down the old railway line to get there, until one night I decided to go camping there. It was the first time I'd gone camping outside my backyard, and as you could probably imagine, I found it quite addictive. I think the first thing I bought after I left school was a basic camping setup. For the next few years, because I spent a good amount of time outdoors, I wanted to learn how to feel comfortable whilst I was out there, and with the rise of Bear Grylls and other TV presenters like Ray Mays, information was easy to come by. I was quite fortunate at the time that all my mates was up for learning, but over the years, one by one, they grew up and slowly started their own families. Not me though, I was fucking born to be wild. I took a job for the next six years working as a nightclub doorman. I was working in an area of all which had a reputation of drug and alcohol fueled misbehaviour, to put it politely. The places I worked sold alcohol extremely cheap, which attracted the absolute dregs of society, most of them unemployed. Thinking about it now reminds me of something a wise old Obi-Wan Kenobi said, you will never find a more wretched half of scum and villainy. This was quite a low point in my life. I didn't actually realise it at the time because it was like being in a room that smells like shit. When you stay there for long enough, you get used to the smell. Being around folk like that is not healthy, and it's hard to see that at the time. I retreated to the woods and missed the tranquility of nature every chance I got. With each and every passing weekend, I got to see a repulsive side of humanity that made me despise the public. And a lot of the time, I couldn't even talk to them, most of them being dumb breeders and useless eaters who wouldn't even be able to grasp any form of conversation beyond the level of sports ball. Being in the sticks at night made me feel immortal. They have a way of transforming into a sanctuary of shadows. The rustling leaves and nocturnal whispers of the wind conspire to conceal my every movement, creating an impenetrable fortress. Only a madman with an axe would dare step out here. After working the doors, I got a job in a factory, freeing my weekends up. At first I started drinking on a weekend because that's just what you do. Yeah, if you're too petrified to step away from the normal conformist lifestyle because the thought of not reaching social expectations paralyses you with fear. I was like that once too, up until the next chapter in my life. Now then boys and girls, I'm on my first break. And usually, if I was in England and I was walking around these sort of like hills or anywhere in fact, I'd have a brew kit with me and obviously I can't take everything with me so I've had to make do with some Red Bull which I'm not an enormous fan of. I remember when I was about 16 years old I was absolutely rat assed on vodka and Red, Red Bull, mostly vodka <laughs> and uh, I remember like absolutely puking my guts up at about, I don't know, after about an hour in. And after that, every time I drink Red Bull, I can taste vodka. <laughs> it's disgusting. <laughs> so at the moment I'd die for a coffee, but I can't get one. So uh, the next best, best thing I guess is Red Bull. It's been an absolute corker of a day. I picked a right good day to do this. I, I was a bit worried just in case I couldn't do it actually because <laughs> it has been quite shitty lately so um, yeah the first the first half of this was like downhill all the way to the bottom of the valley then I started having to climb back up and I can imagine from here till the destination point it's going to be all uphill by the looks of it but that's that's not a problem We've, uh, we've got a bit of sugar in our system now, so I can handle it. <laughs> so, yeah, 
the, the views are absolutely spectacular. And I kind of come out here to to sort of like reminisce, to, to think about where sort of like my life has been, where it's headed, and that sort of bollocks. And I don't know, it's it's funny, it's funny where life takes you. Just ten years ago, I would I would never in a million years imagine sort of where I'd be now. <laughs> By that point, I hadn't even been out of the country or anything, and the last 10 years it's just been <laughs> adventure, <laughs> and I've, I've really enjoyed every moment of it. Like, um, that's when I really started stepping out of my comfort zone, and yeah, it's just, it's just so insane where you find life taking you. In 2013, I joined the East Yorkshire Survival Group, an eccentric band of scoundrels who also take to the woods to escape the conventional way of life. It's been a transformative experience that went far beyond the realm of survival skills. Through the crackling flames of our campfire, we delved into deep philosophical discussions, questioning the very essence of life and our place in the natural order. The woods became our classroom. I learned a lot from the other fellas. I'll be much, much older than I am. Out there you don't have to worry about saying or doing anything out of the normal. We're encouraged to do that, to be ourselves. In winter 2013, we met up with the West Yorkshire Survival Group and I had the pleasure of meeting a chap from there. Again, a much older and wiser man than myself. He was saying things that night that even I thought was do lal. I looked around to see all the old boys was not only agreeing with him, but that we were hanging on to every word he said. This was some serious tinfoil act shit. Before then, I only really went on the opinions of everyday people, and without trying to sound disrespectful, I think they might have been taken from a mainstream perspective. It was only said enough times so people can remember and repeat. Therefore, it must have been true, because in politics, lies are only facts that haven't been repeated enough. The fault was really my own though, because I should have questioned before I took them opinions on myself. People are free to believe whatever they want to believe. But when I got home, and now after 10 years of looking into what was said that night, along with more recent examples that we've all lived through, I'm pretty convinced that life is way more different than what we're led to believe. Coming into this shattered my entire perception on life. It's funny how we all think we know so much. But the reality is that at any moment of our lives in the present time, we've only ever really got half the picture. Over time, lies become exposed and it becomes increasingly difficult to hide the truth, especially now that information is spreading at the pace it is. The only thing to do from here is try and brush it under the rug and pretend it didn't happen. I learned that one enormous commodity that we all have access to is information, so naturally I took to the books. I left the factory and was working as a caretaker where I spent two thirds of my shift reading, seeing as though there was little else to do. Plus, we had a library two minutes away on foot that was part of the site. Because of my background in bushcraft, I obviously read into that. From that came primitive history. The books branched out all over the place. It was all primarily based around surviving in the woods, but you'd be surprised at how many different directions this study goes in. Finally, I found myself learning about witchcraft, which progressed towards discovering the Owen, an ancient script primarily used to write the early Irish language, though it was also employed for other Celtic languages. Developed in Ireland during the early centuries of the Common Era, it consists of a series of straight or diagonal lines carved into wood or stone. The script is often inscribed vertically on the edge of monumental stones or occasionally on wooden sticks. Each letter or symbol in the Ohm alphabet is represented by a combination of one to five horizontal or diagonal strokes intersecting a central bass line, with variations based on the position of the strokes relative to the bass line. Over time it evolved beyond its original function as a writing system and eventually associated with divination, reflecting a shift in its cultural significance. In this new context, it became intertwined with spiritual practices and its characters took on symbolic meanings beyond the linguistic origins. 
As a divination tool, it was often used for casting lots or drawing in scraps staves to gain insights into the future or seek guidance in decision making. Each character became associated with specific trees, plants or natural elements, linking the scripts to the rich symbolism of the Celtic landscape. Personally, I prefer to personify the physical characteristics of each letter, which creates an archetype of who I'd like to learn from or aspire to be like. So walking the forest for me becomes more like walking amongst the oldest philosophers on earth. A good friend of mine, a member of the group, always says, if you walk amongst kings, you'll become one. I think this guy's onto something, because in the past, I used to walk amongst fools, and I've since noticed a pattern emerging. Aside from all this, I've always been very fortunate. I've been led to make some very wise choices in my life, and eventually, I managed to surround myself with people who have only encouraged me towards adventure. Many of them would say that I could walk through a war zone and come out smelling roses. I'm not exactly so sure that that's accurate. If it is, then what's more impressive is that I usually walk into the war zone smelling like shit. Ladies and gents, so I've just arrived at the destination and I can tell you for an absolute certain fact now that it is no farmstead or any type of shack. And it's like so I'm just walking through the entrance now to see what we've got. And uh, it's big. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> I am absolutely exhausted if you can't tell. It's been a hell of a walk to get here. Oh my word. Oh my God. I can't see this from any, any angle. I don't know if the forest is because the forest, forest is really thick and I've had to walk through quite a lot of it or oh, the sun was in my face I don't know but I, in fact I couldn't even see it on the drone I'm gonna I'm gonna get the drone out for you now so you can have a look at it So ladies and gents, it looks like we've got ourselves a cast oil to explore. <laughs> I do not know how I do it. Seriously. <laughs> I came out looking for a shack <laughs> or something like that. You know, something really small. I wasn't expecting this. Bloody hell, Raymondo. <laughs> it's left me with more questions. Than, uh, <laughs> than what I had before I left the house. Bloody hell. I need to dig, oh, it's cold. I need to dig some things up. Uh, explain what's sort of going on with this place because uh, like I literally found it a minute ago. <laughs> you know? uh, but yeah, I was just thinking on the way here as well. That little episode I had with a Red Bull when I was about 16 years old and I got absolutely wrecked to the point it traumatised me and completely changed like, the way my taste buds work. Yeah, I was just thinking earlier on that if that never happened I might be just be sat in a bar <laughs> like getting drunk every night a big fat middle-aged balding slob I'm just a big fat middle-aged balding slob that's sober 
Wow, oh my god, the view down there is. Oh, I saw this. I, <laughs> I did see that. I pan it round there. Um, so look, yeah. I kind of saw the edge of that, but I did. I didn't realise it was this castle. <laughs> what a donut! <laughs> Jesus. I mean, I can understand exactly why they built it here. Look at the, look at that. The amount of miles you can see. It's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, I'm so shocked. I genuinely do not know how I do this stuff. <laughs> On further research, I discovered that my castle was actually a fortress. Nestled 532 metres above sea level, this behemoth stands as a testament to the rich history and strategic significance that shaped the landscapes of Italy during the medieval period. Other than its first documented reference in 1028 AD, the original date of this structure isn't so accurate. But I later went to visit the local tour guide in Orchatico, who provided me with more details from his small library of books. The original structure was built for defensive purposes between the 4th and the 8th century AD by the Longbeards, a Germanic tribe who inhabited the lands of Tuscany after the peak of the Roman Empire. The layout of the fortress is unknown, but it was the later occupants who expanded it by building the outer walls between the 10th and the 14th century. During this time, we would have seen many battles taking place for the capture of this stronghold because of the importance of it. It was much easier to control the surrounding land with this in the possession. For centuries, the armies of Volterra, Pisa and Florence would fight to gain domination. So over the course of this bloody period, they would have exchanged hands until around the 15th century, where Florence lost a battle against Pisa, leaving the fortress abandoned. Today, as the sun sets behind Rocca di Pietra Cassia, it continues to stand as a silent witness to the passage of time, a tangible link to a rich and storied past. This fortress, with its resilient spirit and timeless allure, invites us to step into the pages of history, where we can only see in our mind's eye what this place would have felt like back in the times of old. If only stones could speak. As for me, I enjoyed looking back on my life. The amount of directions I could have gone is incalculable. I know many who have taken a wrong turn. Some have met their unfortunate fate as a result, whereas others have gone down a never-ending downward spiral, which I only hope they can one day recover from. The roads I've taken have not always been easy, but they've usually been rewarding, and I had many lessons to learn by many folk and trees along the way. Maybe that's what the birch had in mind for me today, to explore the depths of my own past and realise where it led me. I've been dragged down and pulled to pieces by many a folk, but up here, I feel a sense of gratitude towards the people who have nurtured my inquisitive nature as it was still developing, and those who encouraged me to push forward and follow wherever my heart guards me. That and the thought of going back to the room that smells as shit is what gets me off my ass every day, and out into the unknown.